Good morning. It's season three of GI and a Cup of Joe. Thank you all for making seasons one and two a huge success. Again, I'm your co-host, Annie T. And I am Justin C. It's pretty badass to hear all these stories of how everyday regular people with everyday regular struggles took a chance to better themselves with the opportunities in the Idaho Army National Guard. And they didn't just do it for themselves, they did it for their families, future, past, and present. Officially, I'm Sergeant First Class Annie Torres. And I am Command Sergeant Major Justin Cole. We encourage everyone listening to uh, Dress Right Dress. Which is like, share, and subscribe. Enjoy Season 3. Season three. Season three. Two truths and a lie. Go. Oh, man. Okay. I'm going to get you. Ready? Yep. Number one, I once ate my pet for Christmas Eve dinner. <laughs> it was delicious. Uh, uh-huh. uh, number two, I learned to weld from an Amish guy in Mexico. <laughs> <laughs> Super random. <laughs> wow. Okay. Uh, number three, I once backed over my dog, and a week later, backed over my new dog, and that's why we started raising mastiffs. Oh my god! Okay. I know. <laughs> and go. Oh wait, and discuss. <laughs> uh, okay, so first I'm going to try to pick, right? Okay. Yeah. Um, One of those is a lie. Okay. Uh, I'm going to say there's no way you backed over two dogs a week apart. I did have mastiffs. I don't know. Okay, that's my choice. That's what I'm. Tell us a story. All right. Tell All us right. A story. That's a lie. But we did have mastiffs, but I didn't back over little dogs. I would never do that. I would probably still be crying if I did that. Wow. Uh, I remember the story about you backing into a motorcycle. Oh, my God. Right? Yeah, so, I cried over that. I, uh, it was my husband's fault. He parked directly behind me, so yeah. his fault, not mine. <laughs> <laughs> and I was pregnant, so he had two strikes against him. <laughs> uh, uh, yep. Uh, but I did eat my pet for Christmas Eve dinner. It was my 4-H lamb my dad bought at the 4-H market when we sold him at the fair. And Albertsons bought my lamb. So my dad went to Albertsons and bought the meat. And we cooked it up for Christmas Eve dinner. And my aunt was so disgusted. <laughs> okay, She's like, oh, so this meat is so good. I'm like, yeah, it's my pet, Herman. She's like, what? <laughs> I'm like, yeah, it was a lamb. You were cool with it. Uh, yeah. T- we, I raised him to be a carcass animal. So I knew he was going to get butchered. I knew he was being judged on the meat. Yeah. And that's why my dad wanted him because he was a champion lamb. So yeah. he was good meat, right? Well, <laughs> 4-H. I was a farm kid. What can I say? Yeah, nothing wrong with <laughs> Perfectly that. Perfectly natural. <laughs> and then I did learn to weld from an Amish guy in Mexico. Uh, I went on a mission trip with my dad twice, actually, down to Mexico. It was a bunch of farmers. I forget the name of the company he went with. But a bunch of farmers went down and helped build, like, um, what would it be called? Oh, I forgot the word. Like a camp, like a summer camp. Okay. Um, and we, I was learning to weld on bunk beds. And this Amish guy from Minnesota, who was a fellow farmer, right. showed me how to weld. Oh, and he Amish. was like a picture-perfect Amish guy. Amish guy from Minnesota. Uh, down in Mexico. There's a lot of like state connections here, too. When I you know. listen to this podcast, it's like the same 11 states <laughs> I know <laughs> that either everybody's lived in or visited or knows people in. So it's crazy. All right. What are yours? Try to stump me. All right. Um, again, mine are random, just like yours, right? So... Uh, I once sailed Lake Superior on my own. I once hiked the base of Mount St. Helens and Mount Rainier in a single weekend. And I once played video games through an active robbery. (laughs) Oh, my goodness. Well, played video games through an active robbery. If your wife was here, I would ask her how often you pay attention. Uh, Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Never. Never. That would be my wife's response. I'm going to say it's the sailboat one. I know you lived in Michigan, you said? Minnesota. Minnesota. Yeah. Yep. Are you Amish? No. Okay. <laughs> no, not Amish either. Candle maker? No. Nope. Um, yeah, I'm going to say that one because I think you're little. I think you were younger when you lived there. I was younger okay. when I lived there. Uh, but actually, that's truth. That's weird. Yeah. Why were you sailing across the ocean <clears throat> blue by yourself? Well, um, Lake Superior, it's one of the bigger... Uh, Great Lakes. And once you get to certain points in the lake, you can't see either sides of land, right? So it looks like you're on the ocean. Right. And uh, my father uh, was a, uh, he had his captain's license. So he taught me how to sail. Your dad's a boat captain? He he was a boat captain. That's amazing. So 
He spent the later years of his life actually down in San Diego running people to the Canalita Islands and back. Oh. He like lived on a boat and that's what he did for work was take him out and to the islands and back and nice. that's how he made his money. But anyway, he taught me how to sail and uh, we were on Lake Superior and uh, it was about 11, 11 or 12 hours of sailing time and he sailed in front of me. I sailed behind him on my own, my own boat. It was a 21 foot boat. Wow. And, uh, but it was from two bays. Um, I think it's called two bays to like Copper Harbor, Michigan. So I went from one state to another. Wow. How old were you? Oh man, I was 12. (laughs) Good grief. Right. So yeah, it was, but again, my father was there. He was in the front. Sure. Right. Sure. So, um, any last minute guess? Uh, Oh, um, it was a Mount St. Helens one. I know you lived in Mount St. Helens though. In Mount Rainier? Yeah. I'll say that's a lie. It is. That is a lie. Because I can't remember the first thing you said. (laughs) Right. So um, I have hiked the base of them both times uh, when I was younger, when I was uh, uh, 18. And um, it's like a total of 90 miles. I couldn't do it in a single weekend. So, But um, But you have done it. I have done it. I have done it. So, uh, and the last one was I once played video games through an act of robbery. And that one's actually a truth. That is insane. Uh, I was 15, Phoenix, Arizona. I moved around a lot too. I was all over the place. But um, you remember, uh, or maybe you don't, but stand-up video games inside of uh, 7-Eleven, yeah. right? Street Fighter. Yeah. It was a thing. I had a pocket full of quarters. I started playing that thing and I was dialed in on it. And <laughs> while I was playing the game, somebody walked in and robbed the 7-Eleven. Oh my God. Uh, at gunpoint, took all the money, ran out. They called the cops, and it was actually the police officer when they walked in and tapped me on the shoulder. And he's like, hey, we need to take a statement from you. And I'm like, you statement for what? <laughs> and he explained what happened. He was like, I didn't see anything. And, of course, he laughed. Uh, the store owner obviously didn't laugh, <laughs> right, because he was planning on me being a, a witness. But I didn't literally saw nothing. Oh I played the video games the whole time. So. Did you show him your high score? I didn't have a high score. <laughs> I was just dumping money into this thing, and I was losing constantly. So it was bad. Oh, my God. I'm kind of glad to be doing these stories that we're doing. Um, Gives us an opportunity to, like, inject a little bit of real life, real people, real scenarios. And uh, I don't know. These last couple of seasons that we had have been actually pretty spectacular when you get to know these people. There's a lot of people, like close people, that you work around on a daily basis. And you get them in here, you know, for 20, 25 minutes. And their stories are just phenomenal. Yeah, I've learned something new about every single one of them. Yeah. And I've known some of these people for years. Yeah. and I, Most of them. And I'll say it again. You know, we, you, know you have a, this tracker and you're like, well, okay, is this another band guy, <laughs> right? It's just weird how things are so connected when yeah. you look at everything. Were you in band? Were you in theater? You know, we've all lived in similar states, really yeah. close to each other yep. at, at one point, And you had no idea. And, and a lot of them have the same reasons why they join too. Their yep. stories are very similar. What? Oh, yeah. And you get through the how you communicate portions of it and what do you think good leaders are. And all of that is the same response across the board. Which I think is great. It is great. But it's something we struggle so bad with. All the time. Right. Everybody, I don't know what it is. Maybe it's the frustrations. Maybe it's the human condition. I don't know. But if we all say the same thing or similar things and we all believe the same thing, when put in a situation to do that, it's such a struggle to do that, right? And I think that there's there's a measure of that where you don't know what the other side of the coin is. You don't know the other 50% of somebody's story. So it goes immediately into judge mode, and then you fill in the blanks on what you think, and that becomes the narrative. And so it's it's good to hear these perspectives from all walks of life. Absolutely. Like From the, newbies to old-timers. Yep. Everywhere in between. Yep. It's actually refreshing. A lot of these stories did have a common theme, though, fear of the unknown. Um, I know I had that when I first joined because I joined on a whim. I was bored. I was like, this sounds like something to do. I'm just going to do it. And then I signed up and I was like, what What did I just do? Right. And it's because I didn't know. But everyone we've talked to in seasons one and two shared that same fear. Did yeah. you have it when you joined? Oh, absolutely, I did. Right. Um, you know, I joined when I was 17. I went in the delayed entry program, you know, and I started in the reserves. And it does, nothing prepares you for it. But I think around the ages of 16 or 17 is when you're like, you're kind of reading 
you know, the adult tea leaves. Right. Things start hitting you in the face and you're like, what am I going to do? I am 16 months away from graduation. What's my plan? And you don't have a plan. Nope. And even back then, yeah, uh, not too long ago <laughs> for anybody Just that's for listening. <laughs> yeah, not too long ago, but even back then, college was it, right? Are you going to go to college? You're going to go to college. You're going to go to college. Well, well how am I going to pay for it? Yeah. You know, and you're not knowledgeable in loans. You don't want to talk to anybody because you sound stupid, you know, and you're not to be, you know, a lot of people grew up and had really engaged parents. I had working class parents, right? So they were constantly working all the time. And uh, so you didn't know what you were doing. Right. And I remember when I came home and I had made the decision, like, I'm going to join, I'm going to join the army. And my, I remember my mom was like, yeah, okay. Sounds like a good idea. <laughs> I was like, well, all right. <laughs> okay. Looks like I'm doing it. Go. Right. So yeah. Uh, terrified would probably be a good word. Yeah. You know, you just, it's such a massive step for somebody so young, but you know, that, that's how it is. And you're still young, right? I am. <laughs> it wasn't that record. long ago. <laughs> I know my dad was relieved when I told him I was joining the guard because it was I was actually doing something with my life. He just saw me waste probably four years of my life trying to figure myself out. But that's okay. And right. we've learned that a lot of people did the exact same thing, took off a couple years and trying to figure out who they are, and then they joined the guard. And right. they're super successful now because they're they have a more mature mindset, I think, being well, that later on. I look back on it and I think that maybe something you said, maybe in season one, but you don't really start learning until you start making some mistakes. Yeah. Right? Yep. That's how we learn. So, yeah, absolutely. Like, hit the go button, go out into life. This isn't the path that I wanted. Here's the decision I'm going to make. Well, I'm excited for uh, season three because we're going to talk about um, or ask all of our guests about effective communication. And I think that's super important as well as leadership. Kind of get down to it. You know, everything's been not necessarily scratching the surface, but I think that we've been kind of digging around effective communication and empathy for the last couple of seasons. I think so, too. And then we get to this one. We're like, OK, let's just ask these hard questions like go ahead and describe to us A, B or C. So I there and again, all of their responses were very similar. They were. So they were. They offered some great perspective, though. I agree. So how about how about for you in your own words? What is the best way to explain effective communication? Well, something I didn't learn until, uh, and I'll say very recently, right? I've always felt like I was a good communicator. Um, I had um, the ability to orate or whatever. I'm using big words. (laughs) Um, Fairly well. Uh, But somebody had taken me aside and and had basically said, hey, it's it's not really about what you say. It's about what people hear. And and I think I was in my, well, I was. I was in my late 40s when I heard that. And I'm like, oh. It was like the light bulb finally came on. So then I can, you know, I take that and I take a step back and I look at all the times that I struggled to communicate with certain people, you know, and you can say the, you can apply the army learning model and and all these buzzwords and right. But the reality is some people learn through tactile touch. Some people have to read it. You know, some people need an example, but it's really up to you. Like if you need to effectively communicate, it's 100% on you. And if you understand that, okay, now, what did you hear me say, right? If you, if you take an opportunity to break it down, something as simple as that, like, here's what, what I need to get across to you. Um, here's why I believe it's effective. And then you ask people, like, well, what did you hear me say? And I am floored by how many people repeat back something they've filtered through their perceptions, their beliefs, sure, right? how they changed your words. And it comes back and it's totally different. And you're like... That's not what I said. <laughs> Wait, what? That's not what I meant. So like, and I think we joke in here too about breaking it down Barney style. Right. Right. <laughs> uh, you have to break it down Barney style almost. To, and not to be like, I'm not trying to be rude. I'm not trying to insult anybody's intelligence, but here it is, A, B, and C, what I'm trying to say. Now, what'd you hear me say? Well, I think the flip side of that is everybody who, um, I guess that you're talking to needs to be aware of how they learn because I know I'm the person who needs to be shown so I can read a book on how to do things, but I need to actually see it be done. And I only need to be shown once because I will make mental notes of where things go, what to do. Uh, Just like I think I talked about being a supply sergeant in season one, um, I would always go and ask, give me the form you want me to submit and give me an example of that form because I want to know exactly how you want it filled out. I don't want to read it in a book. I don't want to do all these practical exercises. Show me what you want. You only have to show me one time. That's how I learn. So 
on the flip side of what you said, people need to be aware of how they learn best in order for you to eff- effectively communicate. I, I agree with that, you know, but I, I understand that there's a flip side to the coin. Yeah. Maybe there's like three sides to the coin. Right? <laughs> okay. Because it would be my job if I'm talking to somebody to, I guess, figure out, because not everybody knows how they communicate. Not everybody knows, like, I need this to be successful. And not trying to pull, like, information out of people, but, okay, how do you need this delivered? And it's hard to raise your hand in the middle of, you know, a swarm of people saying, I don't understand. That right. is so hard to do. And nobody will, almost nobody will do it, yeah, right? Yeah, they won't admit to it. And I, I know for me personally, when I learn or how I learn is I need as few words as possible. What do you need it to look like at the end? You're like, right. Tell me what the that needs result. to look like and then don't talk to me. Right. right? I'm going to figure it out. Yeah. Like, I'll do it my way. I'll, I'll get it done. So, yeah, it's... I don't know. Effective communication is important, but I think there's a lot of factors that go into that. I agree. And there's so much responsibility on the on the people talking and the people receiving. Yep, there is. So, um, and you've been a leader for a long time. So if you notice someone who's struggling to understand, how do you how do you get through to them? Like, do you just pull them aside? Do you talk to them offline? What are some things you do? Well, you know, I know that I personally struggle on the empathy side of things, um, and it's not that I'm. I lack empathy, but there's times when I know um, that I should, hey, why don't you come and sit down and talk to me, right? And it's just not a way that I learned, and it's not a way that I needed. And so the old bad habits always come up like, well, I just need you to say this is what it needs to look like. Right. And in my head, I'm like, okay, I've given you all the stuff that I would need to do it. (laughs) Why can't you go do it with all the... Right. (laughs) Like, I, I don't understand. What's the hesitation here? I think because I'm the one that struggles with it, I would want somebody to come down and remind me about the empathetic portion of conversation and kind of that, that, that connection that humans make when they, when they communicate. And, and you can tell when somebody's making like an honest connection with you, like I'm really yeah. truly hearing you, you know, listen twice, speak once, all those things come into play. And I, I would think just from my perspective, what I would need from anybody, and it doesn't, it's not rank indicative. I know we said that before too, but I don't, like anybody should come up and say, hey, I just need you to, I need you to seriously sit down and listen to me because this is bothering me. And they'll get everything that they need out of me. But, you know, when I look at leaders who struggle with communication, I always put myself in that seat because yeah. it's a daily challenge. Yeah, I so, agree. What about you? I agree. Um, I'm like, I lost my train of thought. Sorry. <laughs> That's all right. I was listening to you. <laughs> Um, okay. So you see somebody struggling with communication. So if it's one-on-one, I will naturally break it down Barney style because it's one-on-one and I can, and I can talk in a way where I don't make feel, make people feel like a dumbass. And I think that's what a lot of people are afraid of. Right. Right. Um, but if I'm teaching a class and I notice somebody like struggling to, you know, write down what I say or to comprehend what's going on, I will make note of that person and talk to them on break. Or I will, you know, find a E6 or E5 to maybe go talk to that person to see if they can get through to them. And then we'll talk after class. I'm, I'm really big on not diming people out in public. Um, but I'm aware of who is struggling. I like that. Um, I am, God, I'm not going to say it on the other side of the coin again, <laughs> but I'm totally on the other side of the coin of this one. Oh, man. Um, the way that you do it, absolutely. Um, I think that's probably more effective than mine. <laughs> but when we're talking about diamond people out, I personally like to dime, like, I like, I don't understand, right? Okay, diamond yourself out. Yeah. I'm, I'm the same way. I, I'm not afraid to raise my hand. Right. I'm just, I guess, thinking about other people. No, and I'm the same way. Like, if you can read body language and read the room, like, I like using that one a lot. Like, hey, read the room, man. Like, you you don't want to make somebody feel alienated. Every military school I've gone to, I've never been afraid to say, uh, can you slow down? Can you, you know, re-explain that? Whatever. And you say the words, right? Because then it opens up people around you. Like, hey, I don't know if I'm the only guy that's uh, having a handicap here, but it's pretty substantial. I have no idea what you're talking about. Yeah. Right? And then you... You usually get other people like, oh, yeah, me too, me too. Right. You're never alone. I promise you're never alone with misunderstanding or not understanding. Right. And I I think that's a solid trait typically found in people that don't really care what people think of them, right? (laughs) Yep. You're like, hey, the mission says I got to do this. I don't understand. Hey, I don't understand. Right. Right? So. Right. 
Right. So what advice would you give to a leader on how to effectively communicate? I mean, it kind of goes hand in hand with what we talked about, but. Right. It's not personal. It's not at all. Man, when you naturally in this position, I'm always confronted with the problem of um, any time that I talk to anybody, they take it as correction. You're right. And it's not. Because your rank not. is scary. Well, it's not either, <laughs> right? Um, so it's not personal. That's what I would tell a leader, right? This isn't personal. What advice would you give? Like you sit here in the marketing realm, everybody comes and talks to you. What advice are you going to give to a leader? I would ask them to get to know their team and the key people that they deal with on a, on a regular basis. Um, you're not going to effectively communicate to everybody because like you said before, not everybody is going to you know, receive the same way. But pick out your key people who can help spread your message the correct way with the best intent and focus on them. Nice. That's very, very <laughs> leader response. I like uh, it. Okay. <laughs> no. No, I like it a lot. And you can't control what people, what people pick up. You cannot control that. So again, don't take it personal. Right. Well, we are out of time for today. Join us next Wednesday for another episode of GI and a Cup of Joe. As we said in the beginning of the podcast, please dress right dress and enjoy your week.